Okay, my name is Valentin Bruttel. The, the aim of this talk is to give non-scientists an overview over the most important evidence of the origin of SARS-CoV-2. I will start with a, a very short introduction and then review the origin articles that have been published by virologists and why I have some problems with them. I will then talk about what makes this outbreak unusual, about the very important diffuse proposal, what a furin cleavage site is and why the one in SARS-CoV-2 is very different from what we see in other viruses, and then about the molecular evidence. And this is quite a complex topic. We talk about ancestral viruses and about surprising finding of SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins in a patient sample from 2019. And then we'll conclude with a short summary of how synthetic viruses are assembled and how we can see basically fingerprints or patterns of assembly in a synthetic virus. Let's start with a few sentences about me. I'm a co-inventor of autoimmunity mitigating biologicals or AIM-BIOS. Basically, this technology uses a novel mechanism, a mechanism we discovered in the embryo, that helps the embryo to switch off the immune responses that come from the mother and would react to the father's antigens in the embryo and could basically destroy the embryo. But the embryo has protective mechanisms. We know a lot of immunosuppressive mechanisms. However, none of these mechanisms really explain why at the same time other immune responses are not really majorly affected. So for example, immune responses against viruses, against bacteria, they all keep going while the embryo is not touched. And we found this HAG molecule here, which can present epitopes. And these epitopes induce selective tolerance in the mother's immune system. So they tell the mother, don't attack me, although I'm foreign, but still keep attacking everything else. And we remodel these molecules and add, instead of the embryonic peptides, we add peptides that are causing autoimmune diseases. And thereby, we have shown in, in several mice that we can basically prevent autoimmune symptoms very efficiently and at the same time very selectively. So we don't expect any clinically relevant side effects here. We won actually two uh, industry biotech awards with this tech. And I hope to be able to put this into a startup fairly soon. This project also involves working with uh, a lot of technologies and cells that are important in synthetic virology. So while I'm not an expert in virology, I know quite a bit about the methods that are used to assemble these viruses because they are mostly copied from mechanisms that we also use. Very brief background, I studied biomedicine at the University of Würzburg. I then did a master in molecular medicine at Trinity College in Dublin in Ireland. I have a PhD in tumor immunology again from the University of Würzburg where I was also then moving into autoimmune diseases and basically I work a lot in the field of immunity and as a bioengineer. I'm not a virologist. The aim here is basically to provide you with an alternative uh, perspective from a molecular biologist and to do that as neutral and fact-based as possible. I think it's extremely important in every discussion about the origin of SARS-CoV-2 because it has been such a horrific, devastating pandemic that people mention their conflicts of interest. And I cannot declare any here, really. I'm not compensated at all for this work. And I did all of this work basically without any funding in my free time. And I have no gain-of-function projects whatsoever, not associated with anybody who works on synthetic viruses. I do this basically because I want to prevent harm. I think the, the technology of synthetic virology is very, very dangerous. I feel kind of obligated for giving back for excellent training that I got that was mostly for free. And I am just yeah, committed to truth. This is actually the, the motto of the university. I think this is such a huge catastrophe that we should only be guided by that and not by any political views, parties, or um, how this helps your career or not. In such huge disasters, we only oversee 
a very small field and therefore it's very important that we are just sticking to what we believe is true. Um, of course, I could be wrong with things. Um, so I always show whenever I, I put my own opinion down, I'll highlight this in blue. Again, it's very important that this is completely my own personal opinion. These are my own assessments. This has nothing to do with my employer. I'm not representing any institution here. Let's start with a brief introduction. We have an airborne pathogen that kills many people near a large biosafety lab. We know that the ruling Communist Party blames the local meat market and then a lot of livestock is killed, a lot of stray dogs are culled. And we have Western experts that are getting into the country, but they don't really get access to the labs or to witnesses. But nevertheless, they confirm that this is a completely natural origin. And basically everyone assumes that to be the case until something happens. And if you want to pause here and think about what happens next, then you can do that. Um, the surprising answer may be that, that Boris Yeltsin admits it was a lab leak 13 years after the accident. And I'm not talking about Corona here, obviously. I'm talking about the 1979 Sverdlovsk anthrax leak, which is, of course, a very different story. But I still think we can learn a lot about this accident because there are, well, all these similarities. And one is, of course, that governments are not always telling the truth. We all know that maybe especially problematic in communist countries. We know that from this case, the accident evidence actually, despite the opposing expert opinions, was pretty overwhelming and also very easy to understand. So in this case, for example, all the cases were, were downwind of the outbreak and the patients had mostly affected lungs and not intestines. So fairly obvious. This is not something they ate. This is something they inhaled. Then later, two people were actually exhumed, two of these uh, victims. And from the sequencing of the bacteria, we know that these are typical lab strains. So basically, all the experts and all the newspapers and everybody was just wrong here for 13 years. A highly unusual series of origin articles. If you would have talked to me like three years ago about this, I would have most likely said, okay, this is a case closed. This is a natural virus. We have so many experts saying they are absolutely certain. We have here five professors writing the proximal origin article very early on. They say this is not a laboratory construct. We have Lancet, a very prestigious medical journal, publishing a statement by, I think, like 35, 36 biologists that all say that they condemn conspiracy theories suggesting that SARS-CoV-2 does not have a natural origin. And then we have later articles by, again, completely different scientists that say it's a conspiracy theory that this could have been a laboratory virus. So basically, it, it sounds like case closed, right? How can so many independent experts be wrong? But what is really interesting in these cases is that what we are told in these publications is not at all what these people were telling each other in internal communications and in internal emails. And we don't know these emails because they later said, here, guys, we were wrong. Here are our emails. We only know them through Freedom of Information Act lawsuits in the United States where we have this amazing opportunity to basically check on the work that people that are paid by the government do. That is just not possible in Europe, unfortunately, and I think we should we should change that. So if you look at their internal communications in this paper, they say that some of the features here, a very small part at least, potentially looks engineered. And pretty much all of the authors all say that they find this genome inconsistent with expectations from evolutionary theory, so with natural evolution. We also know about Ian Lipkin. Basically, he wrote in emails around that time that this paper does not eliminate the possibility of an inadvertent release following adaptation through selection. And that given the, the large amount of bad coronavirus research that is done in Wuhan specifically, that there is a nightmare of circumstantial evidence to assess an email conversation between Xi Sheng Li and Ralph Barrick, 
Uh, Ruth Barrick is an expert in uh, the assembly of synthetic viruses, and Shi Xing Li is the, the head of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. She's basically an expert in uh, collecting these bad coronaviruses and characterizing them. And she writes that she doesn't agree with one of his sentences in an interview that sounds basically he doesn't know what she's doing in Wuhan. And that, for example, Ian Lipkin is also in a close collaboration with a lab in Guangdong. So an important conflict of interest. None of these conflicts of interest are mentioned here. And Ian Lipkin actually changed his mind later once he figured out that this work was done on biosafety level two, which is really, really unsafe. We know from Bob Gary, the last author here, and in, in scientific papers, it's usually the last author that is giving the idea or is like, you know, running the lab and the first author who's doing most of the writing and then those in between contribute. And the most important last author is saying that he really can't think of a plausible natural scenario where you get from the bad virus to an insert with exactly these four amino acids or 12 nucleotides exactly at that position and then no other changes in the S2. So what he was doing here is an alignment. He was comparing two viral protein sequences of the spike proteins. I'll put a link to the software that does that in the description and basically you can feed it with these sequences and then it will tell you how these sequences match best. And as you can see here for an expert, it's fairly obvious that basically everything in the S2 part is completely identical as one, one tiny mutation here and then here. Um, but there is this insertion. So four amino acids that are not mutated as amino acids here, that's much more common to occur, but that are basically inserted and not there in the natural related virus, red chief uh, 13. And these amino acids here form a few cleavage site, which always needs a sequence of R and then two variable amino acids, another R, which stands for arginine, and that is where a important protease can cleave furin. So basically he says that he can't figure out how this gets accomplished in nature and that he would do exactly such experiments in a virus like Reggie 13 because this is not a human pathogen. It's not so dangerous to do it there. Mike Farzan, who's actually discovered the receptor for SARS-1 virus, is also basically saying that this virus could have come from uh, a lab, especially with working on a B cell 2, which was done here, for example, from a passaging experiment. And what they mean with passaging experiments is that you, you take a, a virus um, that is, for example, adapted to a bat, and then you basically pipette supernames of the virus or wherever you get that virus from onto human cells. And basically that red indicates adaptation to bats here or to some other animal. And then after a couple of days, those viruses that have some mutations that enable this virus to grow in these human cells, those will propagate, not very efficiently, but they will, if the cell line is somewhat susceptible. And then if you repeatedly do that, always give them fresh, for example, human cells, after a while you will have selected the viruses that are most fit and that are fairly well adapted, at least to the receptors. This sometimes is leading to viruses that are then very susceptible to immune responses because there's no immune system here. So they may lose their resistance towards immune cells. But this can also be done, for example, in humanized mice that have the human ACE2 receptor. And then there was one more article, which I find quite interesting. Again, we don't get so strong arguments here. I'd really invite you to like look through these articles and after this presentation, check for yourself uh, which of the arguments you really find convincing. But what's, which is also interesting is that almost all of the important authors here apparently receive, in addition to their normal salary, some consulting fees or compensation for expert testimony. And this is, in my opinion, just not a real conflict of interest statement here. I talked to Stephen Goldstein. He wouldn't tell me who's paying them or for what. But I think this is really, really important to know. That could, of course, uh, inform the reader of, of what uh, could to some extent, impact the view on the topic. So the last article I uh, put out here, I'd really invite you to read this uh, 
really interesting thread by uh, Gilles de Manoeuf, he's excellently informed about these topics, says that there again is no credible evidence for a, a lab origin and calls it a conspiracy theory. And again, it's very interesting to read these email conversations. So here, for example, Susan Weiss is uh, writing to the first author, Shen Lu, I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing this correctly, that uh, do you think it could have come from a bad virus, one that's not published? Because they also have this very close one in their lab. It's a very chilling idea. And he then responds, we can't rule it out. The Wuhan lab has a lot of viruses that are not published yet and that are worked on. And uh, there's always concerns about lab safety. In the, in the later conversation, you can read that he thinks that the diffusion cleavage site may engineer it again. And I think the editor also involved in this conversation, and they are discussing that in one of their labs, there was a SARS-CoV-2 infecting a lab worker. I have no idea uh, if this was ever reported in the news, not that I know of. And um, they are just very worried about lab safety. And it's very complex and many people working on these viruses just don't know how to handle them. They don't have the right PPE, which is personal protective equipment, which apparently was a big issue in China and uh, could be one in many other countries that work on these viruses. And then finally, the Lancet publication, this was uh, signed by Christian Trusten, who was very impactful on the uh, SARS-CoV-2 communication in Germany. The first author here is uh, Charles Kellescher, and he, they write, they condemn these conspiracy theories. But again, in internal emails, he writes that I do not see how anyone could definitely state the virus could not possibly have come from that lab an incidental accidental error infecting a lab worker who subsequently and asymptomatically shed virus could have occurred. So basically, they are somewhat believing in their own conspiracy theory, I think. Uh, later, Christian Trusten wrote that one can see in all his public statements that he was always open for the option that this could have come from a lab. I think this is just a very imprecise statement and it's very important to withdraw your name from these or just completely withdraw the paper if you don't agree anymore. So there are, of course, newer publications on the origin of SARS-CoV-2. I'll just talk about two that were in science that were discussed quite a lot. One is by Michael Vorobey. And basically the key message here was that the Huanan seafood market was the epicenter of this outbreak. And especially in, in interviews, he implies that it, it was not the Wuhan Institute of Virology with the Biosafety Level 4 Lab, which was, I think, 15 kilometers further south. And the evidence here is uh, basically that they see that a lot of the December cases are linked to the Huanan seafood market, abbreviated here, and that many of the positive samples are near wildlife stalls. So those are selling wildlife or live animals or meat, um, and they see more samples in that area. However, in my opinion, there are a lot of problems with these conclusions. Um, uh, for example, one is that at least according to the WHO report, they tested 460 animal samples and they didn't find any trace of SARS-CoV-2 in any of them. Then Peter Amberg, which I think is a, a very, very uh, honest guy, he, he says that at that time there were likely already thousands of cases in Wuhan. I, I find this very plausible. You know, you get a first few sick patients, you have no tests, you cannot tell what that really is. It takes a long time and a lot of uh, these early patients may not have had any symptoms at all until you really notice a pattern here because SARS-CoV-2 is not as lethal as, for example, SARS-1 was or MERS is, right, where 20, 30, 40% of the patients die. Other big weaknesses, there's a huge sampling bias for the market. They specifically uh, sequenced and characterized people that had some connection to the market. Obviously, right? I mean, SARS-1 came from civets, where civets on the wildlife market. So basically, if a patient shows up that is working there or his wife or his 
daughter is working there or he's like going through there for shopping then uh, and he has these symptoms he will this is a uh, likely patient for this new outbreak for a new pandemic and they at this point didn't want to characterize basically the entire population they just wanted to figure out what this virus is and if it's a new virus uh, coming from animals and then there's also the issue of very poor data quality so these dots on the maps they're basically copied from the who report uh, there's no gps coordinations here um, and for example we also know that the wuhan blood bank had at this point 200,000 samples from 2019 which would have been super interesting to look at right you could have just retrospectively looked how many of these samples are positive for SARS-CoV-2 but we didn't get any access the, the, the Chinese Communist Party didn't allow access here um, so there's just very very poor data quality and actually we also know that some of the data was deleted by the NIH in this case it was Jesse Bloom who was able to recover these sequences and uh, basically found that there were many sequences that happened much earlier that are not in the official reports. Another big, big problem here is that uh, the maps simply don't show very important features. So for example, toilets, right? If you have a memory of these huge halls, right? We all have seen these pictures. It's probably seven, eight meters high. They are open at both ends. There's a lot of air going through. Not very likely you, you infect others with an airborne disease here. However, if you look at the toilets, of course, you have a very narrow, very closed area where uh, these uh, aerosols stay in the room. And then there, just above these toilets, actually, was a mayong, a gambling room. Um, where some of these traders like to meet after or doing sales. Some of them are already retired. And actually, there's an interesting thread here um, in the description that shows that quite a few of the um, infected people likely like to gamble there as well. And at least in my opinion, it's uh, fairly likely that this is a place where a virus like SARS-CoV-2 could very easily spread with these tiny windows and very narrow rooms and you sit there for hours. The other big point that's missing is the biosafety level 2 labs. We know that these coronaviruses from bats were not handled in the new biosafety level 4 lab. They were handled at biosafety level 2 or 3 and especially 2 is very unsafe conditions and if you put these into the map, I mean I don't have to say much here I think um, it's just a very very different story that's implied so in my opinion the market uh, for sure was a sampling hotspot so this is where they looked it was possibly a super spreader event and just based on the fact that the first cases were likely already in September October those December cases don't really tell us much about the origin there's an uh, interesting report coming to a similar conclusion now. And uh, basically what's really interesting here is that the same two authors who wrote now that uh, this is uh, just all coming from the market and from December, and uh, they wrote another science article in which they said that uh, it could have started mid-October. And if you include those data that uh, uh, Jesse Bloom made available again, then actually the time point of a possible outbreak is moved even further ahead to mid-September. So basically, this is reading tea leaves, basically, to say that the cases then are telling you a lot about where this came from. The second paper with Picard as first author is based on finding two different lineages of SARS-CoV-2. So basically they have two uh, specific mutations. One is at 8,700 or something and the other one at position 28,000. Doesn't really matter that much, but those two were found uh, in a big group of people. Uh, so one is a CT group and then the other group was a TC group. And they didn't find any intermediate genomes 
with a CC or TT. But of course, there are big problems here. These two mutations are just not a big difference, right? This is not something that evolved for months in some animal and then jumped again, like we've seen for SARS-1. For example, from the famous um, Diamond Princess cruise ship, we learned that, for example, in some patients, we see three mutations occurring, right? We had this very enclosed setting, so we could pretty much from the sequences learn which patient infected which others. And then in theory, we could have a TC patient starting this. And, and then once it reached one of the patients here, these three mutations could have easily led to a CT plus some other mutation genome from the TC genome. So basically you don't need that many people, just two are basically enough to accumulate that many mutations. And I'm absolutely not the only one with that perspective. We see a lot of the main experts, Francois Balou or Jesse Bloom. Actually, Moreno was suggesting here um, that you could reanalyze basically the data with uh, the deleted genomes and also include the intermediate genomes, which were later found, and then uh, redo this analysis and Professor uh, François Balou said that he will just not touch that anymore and he will not let his junior scientists touch it either. Um, he has received such a barrage of hatred and abuse that maybe articles that are just wrong here are just uh, just remain in the public domain because those defending them are so toxic and towards people. But also, I think uh, we should not be directed by or affected that much by such comments. If you have such a position, it, in my opinion, is your responsibility to also publish a paper that says, OK, because of ABC, this is not true. Other people have done that. But the most important point here is that intermediate samples were just ignored. There were a lot of intermediate genomes. And at least some of them have met all the inclusion criteria. So these samples found by Steve Massey, and he, he published this now, were just ignored. This is another point. I think it's just very unlikely to have then, you know, these two jumps from what one or two animals in, in a week um, in the same place and uh, nothing ever before or nothing ever in places where you have thousands of uh, animals uh, it's just very unlikely and then there's one last point which i find quite interesting and that is that actually as in contrast to what we know from animal to human or human to human transmission we usually just you know have like one tiny droplet with i don't know 50 a few hundred viruses uh, that are enough to infect someone else it's very likely that all these viruses have a similar sequence but this is not the case in a lab leak, right? So you know, for example, from the anthrax lab leak, that we only know two, these two exhumed victims, that they are they already at least one or two single nucleotide polymorphisms, so mutations, and maybe up to seven. The reason here is that in a lab leak, sometimes a large volume of, for example, viral supernate can be released, and that can contain different viral lineages already, which is very unlikely for these tiny droplets that are transmitted via air. If you want to read more about these papers, I recommend this uh, interesting article by Michael Bolt. Actually, quite a few of these preprints are now uh, accepted papers. And if you want to hear my summary, I think it's it's really layers of like questionable assumptions and a very toxic debate on top of that that is basically preventing more contradictory reports coming out, but layers of questionable assumptions that lead to this conclusion. So it's basically, if you want to have a picture, it's a bit like saying, this is the flag of Ukraine. You can see in the flag, Ukraine is a communist country because it's completely blue. Well, first of all, the term zoonosis is not, not correct here at all. So you can compare that to this being just the wrong flag. This is the flag of uh, um, Ukraine. As long as you don't know from which animal this comes, and you, you can only speak of an introductory event. And then it, to accept that this is a completely blue flag, you have to ignore all the yellow part, like they completely ignored all the intermediate genomes. The last part is that having a lot of lineages appearing at once is not indicative 
of a natural event, but rather of a lab leak. So it's the completely wrong conclusions. Like, you know, blue is not the, the, the color of communism. This has always been red. This is just layers of questionable assumptions. And a quick summary of the origin literature. These authors, almost all of them, have actually considered a lab accident from the very beginning, a very real possibility in private conversations. And they have not been forthcoming or honest about this, neither in the articles nor later admitting about these conversations. The Varoshes also like to claim that all the scientists say, ah, uh, it's anti-science to question this uh, origin narrative. The only source I found here was a um, poll by uh, Justin Kinney. Uh, there may be some, some bubble bias here. He's not a virologist either, but um, at least it's, it's very obvious that this is not a consensus among scientists, right? Most, in my opinion, will consider the, the origin question just unsolved. And then there's quite a few I talk to that say, yeah, it's way more likely it came from a lab. Moving on, I think the biggest issue here is that many of these articles just don't fulfill academic standards at all. So, for example, contributing authors are not mentioned. Yeah, here, this is from an email uh, exchange between the proximal origin authors and then Jeremy Farrar. Very impactful person as well, right? He's leading a very big grant-giving uh, organization, the Welcome Trust. He basically asked him to change the wording a little bit. It should just be made known to everybody afterwards that he was suggesting changes here you can just write a tiny acknowledgement and they actually like wrote an email where they also thanked Fauci for his guidance and advice writing this paper basically and this is just not mentioned at all uh, to the reader i think this is very important because you know if you need you read an interview let's say with a general and he says that uh, whatever the the war in ukraine was caused by ukraine and then you just read years later that this is not a NATO general or not a Ukrainian general, but a Russian general, that this is very important information to basically put this into the right context for the reader. Then there are conflicts of interest. Uh, the biggest one, probably Peter Daszak. Um, it took a year to basically say that he has worked with the Wuhan Institute of Virology. I'll tell you a bit more about what kind of work he did there later. Uh, but it's really a scandal that this was not mentioned. Um, this was from the conversation that led to the Lancet article, actually. And he asked some of his colleagues, so Ralph Barrick in this case and some others, to not be on that uh, Lancet statement um, to basically make it look more independent. Very questionable behavior. And it kind of shows that he was more organizing this entire uh, statement and not just like, you know, one author amongst 30. Then the last uh, paper is also very interesting because it was literally accepted on the very same day it was received. So it's basically impossible to find good reviewers and then have them, you know, check all the sources, check all the reasoning and write detailed reviews and improve the quality, send that back to the authors and improve all that in, in just one day. This is completely, uh, completely unusual. My conclusion here is just that these, these flaws and conflicts of interest, they justify questioning the expert conclusions in this case. Although I usually completely trust, trust scientists, especially if you have that many scientists with the same opinion. So I think what many people don't understand is that uh, this was uh, coming up in a Richard E. Bright conversation. He's one of the professors who has long warned about the risks of gain-of-function uh, research. A lot of people expect this to be just solved by science. They say, oh, well, you know, you have some scientists saying A, some scientists saying B, and let's just uh, let them be in the same room long enough, and then they will basically figure this out. And um, I think what many people don't understand is that science, academia, is not really designed for um, solving such issues. Uh, it's highly interwoven. There's lots of conflicts of interest. Uh, it's a system that is designed basically to find consensus and avoid obvious mistakes and this works very efficiently if this is a neutral question which is the best receptor for cytokine a 
which as species is uh, most sensitive to uh, ultraviolet radiation or whatsoever, neutral questions, no problem. But the, the entire system completely relies on goodwill and, and having the same common interest of like, you know, finding truth. If someone wants to hide the truth, scientists will just have no psychological training and also just no investigative tools at all. All they can say is, I don't trust that. They can't go and say, oh, we should search that computer or anything alike, right? Um, the very same person that carries out a experiment that could lead to such a viral outbreak could at the same time, you know, just suggest his friends to review his article. So as soon as he reached a critical number of experts in the field, three, four, five, that's enough to, to get an article published in a high-ranking journal. The same author that does this experiment can just reject out of revenge you know, other people's articles or preprints anonymously without risking anything. So it's always risky basically to speak against someone. He can deny funding. He can basically deny positions even for his colleagues. It's always going to be other virologists who, who are uh, deciding which virologist is getting that professorship. And they can also mislead without consequences, really. I mean, these papers are obviously uh, really questionable in the light of these emails. Um, and, you know, it had no consequences. As far as I know, all of these scientists have more money, more grants, and still they have fixed positions. So basically, they could also ask for important evidence to be removed, like we, we've seen with the... Um, with these sequences, the early sequences from the market. So it can be maybe compared a bit to like, you know, church court. Very good if you want to know how to interpret that psalm, that verse, what's the, the meaning of that chapter of the Bible or something. But probably not very efficient if you ask them, how likely is it that you have a problem of, you know, child abuse among your ranks? They all know each other for years and... Um, they will all want their institution and their field not to be portrayed in a bad light. A highly unusual viral outbreak. So what do we know? There's, first of all, a lot of circumstantial evidence. I'll just go through this very quickly. It's not my field of expertise. The, we know that there was a few databases that were taken offline from the Institute of Virology. Um, we have some expert witnesses, for example, from... Dr. Huff, who was working for EcoHealth Alliance, and he said that he had seen some presentations that show that EcoHealth Alliance was, to some extent, involved in, in, in the origin of SARS-CoV-2 or very similar research. Um, then we have this report saying that uh, there were sick researchers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Uh, they had to go to the hospital. It's very unusual for young employees of the uh, uh, such a lab. And then, of course, we have a history of previous lab accidents. This is not the first time something happens. And it's, in my opinion, just very unusual to have your key response facility locked off in such a time where you actually need it the most. Yeah, You should have these experts going into meetings, talking to other professors, to other people all over the world, to your doctors, to your committees, to your politicians, to make sure that all their knowledge is basically given to as many people as possible to uh, get this under control. And we basically see the direct opposite here, that people were told uh, to not speak to the press, not speak to other um, politicians. And uh, basically the whole facility was put into I think, military control. There was this uh, coronavirus exercise, apparently, at the Wuhan airport. Then there was apparently not a lot of people around doing the military Olympics in the fall. It apparently looked a bit like a ghost city, which is very unusual for 11 mil million people living there. There were very suspicious party communication, mentioning viruses coming and going like fog and very difficult to control. You should really read this ProPublica article for that. And then there was actually in 2020 a new law saying that the laboratory should prevent laboratory animals from escaping and should not put them into the market. Yeah, I'll leave that to your interpretation why you, you, you put this into a law. I mean, it was obviously illegal before to sell uh, animals from viral experiments but some of these people are just very poor they can't afford f meat and uh, some of these species are very rare and 
sold at very high prices in China. The most important um, piece of evidence when you talk about the origin of SARS-CoV-2 is, in my opinion, this this proposal. Um, it asked for like 14 millions to diffuse bad coronavirus threats. It uh, went through the media. It's still ignored in a lot of conversations afterwards, which I find really weird. And the key applicants here are Peter Vlasek, Ralph Barrick, uh, Xi Sheng Li. So basically, he was getting the funding organized. Uh, Ralph was the expert for uh, making synthetic viruses or characterizing virus spikes in, in new uh, genetic constructs. And Xi Sheng Li was providing all the viral samples and analyzing them in her lab in Wuhan. There were a lot of other uh, labs and institutions involved. And to me, it's really a serious issue that this report was not made available immediately after the outbreak because it's such an important piece of evidence. And if you have nothing to do with the outbreak, basically, yeah, why don't just go out there and say, look, uh, we had this plan, but we never did anything of that. And um, here it is. It was leaked uh, by some unknown person. And uh, yeah, it's probably one of the most important pieces of evidence. Um, it was not funded, I have to say that, but very, very similar projects were. Some also via the NIH and NIAID, so basically under yeah, Anthony Fauci's control. Um, and a lot of money was going into uh, the one Institute of Virology and Xi Jinping's group at that time more than enough to do some of the experiments. Also, sometimes experiments are started even if you don't have funding or, uh, you know, you may have some, some leftover funding from another project. So you, if this is an idea you really like, you start uh, start the work anyway. Or in this case, Peter Daszak even wrote when his very dangerous work was uh, put on hold for a while that he would still continue supporting the work and fund it. Again, very essential a document tells us so much about um, what kind of experiments they were planning, what kind of questions they were asking, what their motivations were, and the, the descriptions we know sound very similar. Why is this outbreak so unusual? A big, big red flag here is that the Wuhan, Wuhan is just 1,500 kilometers away from where these viruses are usually found in um, bad populations. So there, there are these horseshoe beds that are closer to Wuhan, but they don't harbor uh, very similar viruses. So those are in Yunnan and Laos. Um, and you know, it's Wuhan is just like 1% of the Chinese population. It's kind of unlikely that an outbreak would happen there. There are also very few of the likely 20, 40,000 wet markets in China, in Wuhan. However, it's it's the key bad coronavirus reference center also for Vietnam, Laos, and Myanmar, and all other kind of countries. And uh, from the diffuse proposal, uh, we know that at this point, the Wuhan Institute of Virology had thousands of bad virus samples stored. They had more than 180 already sequenced, but still unpublished, bad coronavirus genomes. So whenever someone tells you, uh, this is certainly not a synthetic virus because no one can make up a, a virus, it's just too complex, and we know that they didn't have a virus like that, then please ask them for these 180 uh, genomes. I would be very interested. They yeah, just have no idea what, what was going on in the one Institute of Virology at the time. And then Yunnan and Laos are a key collection sites. So Yunnan is specifically mentioned, but we also know that the Eco Health Alliance was uh, collecting viruses in, among other countries, Lao People's Democratic Republic. In my opinion, it was just very elegantly explained how this virus, without leaving any trace in between, you know, got collected in southern China, put into a sealed plastic tube, was transported to Wuhan and then the other thing that's very unusual is how well adapted this virus was to the human receptor. The human receptor is ACE2. The affinity actually is, is characterized here um, and the lower this value is basically the stronger 
this outer part of the spike binds to the human receptor ACE2. So the spike protein is made of these two parts. The S1 domain interacts with the receptor and the S2 domain oversimplified basically is responsible for getting the viral genome into the human cell. And we also know that there's a second receptor that SARS-CoV-2 is able to use and that is DC sign or L sign. Um, and this is a receptor that is mostly expressed on macrophages and monocytes. These are cells that basically eat up debris, uh, like when, when cells die, and um, those can also be affected apparent, infected apparently via these LDC sign uh, receptors by SARS-CoV-2. We can easily see how infectious this virus was compared to other outbreaks. So, for example, for Mer with MERS, it took a, a year to get to 100 cases. Yeah. Um, even with SARS, to get to 8,000 cases, it took like six months. Um, we are probably already in the multi-million digits at that point. And again, according to the Schuess proposal, they wanted to use uh, viruses and prioritize those that bind to ACE2, yeah, the first receptor. They wanted to build three to five new genomes per year, yeah, so make a lot of synthetic viruses. Um, and they also were looking at DC sign, L sign specific viruses in this proposal. Yeah, so both receptors. And then they have some experiments that use human cell lines and human ACE2 transgenic mice. So that could explain why we get a higher affinity even than what we have in nature. Although I'm not sure this was the case here. But in, let's, just, let's just listen for a second to Peter Deschek, um, how he explains this work in, in 2016. And other coronaviruses in bats, a whole host of them, some of them looked very similar to SARS. So we sequence the spike protein, the protein that attaches to cells. Then we, well, I didn't do this work, but my colleagues in China did the work. You create pseudoparticles, you, look, you insert the spike proteins from those viruses, see if they bind to human cells. And each step of this, you move closer and closer to this virus could really become pathogenic in people. Then we have an, an email from him from November 2019, where he says that they've made great progress, IDing further viruses, testing them and humanized mice. You know, and these kind of uh, experiments can very likely lead to accidents because mice bite. It's very difficult to handle them with, you know, bite proof gloves. You can easily hurt them. So this is always a high risk of getting an infection. And apparently this kind of work was done 2019. So in my opinion, SARS-CoV-2 has exactly the properties that they are describing in this proposal. I also don't really see evidence for military or, you know, bioweapon bad intentions here. I think you wouldn't go out and Twitter all your progress all the time if, you, if you're working on a secret bioweapon here in this case. A highly unusual cleavage site. What is a furin cleavage site? First of all, as I briefly mentioned, it is a protein, a protease, so a protein that cleaves other proteins, and it cleaves them at a very specific recognition sequence. Basically, these two arginines are required. Further arginines are always helpful. Uh, license, uh, I think, is also good. And these human cleavage sites play a very important role in, in humans, right? For example, a lot of hormones and growth factors and so on are cleaved, are processed, and thereby activated so they can signal. So furin also plays a major role in virus activation. It basically enables viral entry. How is that done? So basically, uh, you've seen this picture. The virus sticks to the surface with uh, S1 domain. Um, that is nice, but if it's just stuck there very, very firmly, nothing really happens and you need to get the viral RNA genome into the cell. So what happens then is that some of the proteases, for example, Tempris 2 is another protease that can do that, uh, cleaves off the, the head, basically the outer part of the spike. And then this actually, the lower part can work like as a transmembrane domain and basically pull the viral vesicle very close to the cell which then fuses, it's a bit simplified here, but in the end that basically 
enables the virus to get its genome into the cell and then uh, this allows uh, for the genome to be transcribed and uh, new viruses to be produced. It can also play a role in fusion to other cells. That's also very important there. Why is uh, furin so critical? So the, the human protein is actually a very nice and uh, simple tool to look into this. So for example, this other protease tempers 2 is, is present in some vital organs, yeah? but for example, not in, in nerve tissues, right? It's there in, the, in endocrine tissues and it's there in the respiratory system at a very low level. So it's not, not that ideal to get infected with an airborne virus. But if you, if you compare these expression levels, um, with furin, you can see that furin is expressed pretty much in every vital, vital organ. Yeah. So nerve tissues and nerve tissues obviously are also present in the heart to uh, control the heart frequency. There, uh, the furin is expressed to high levels and then female reproductive tissues and then in a lot of other organs as well. So basically, it explains why this virus can do such a harm because if only tempers would activate this virus, we would never ge get this virus into, into nerve cells, for example. It is also very special for human cleavage site because it has not evolved through these you know, usual stepwise mutations, like this S mutates into P, that happens very often. Uh, now we got this introduction of these, this block. Um, this is actually from an article from um, Neil Harrison and Jeffrey Sachs and Jeffrey Sachs uh, made a very interesting video about the WHO commission. I uh, you should really watch this, how he got into a conflict with Peter Daszak and was really shocked to learn how much of a conflict of interest he had. You probably have heard a lot that you know, SARS-CoV-2 is the only SARS-related coronavirus uh, with a human cleavage site. Technically, that is, that is not true. Um, because we have a few synthetic ones. For example, SARS-1, in which furin cleavage sites were introduced. It was known, for example, for MERS, which naturally has these furin cleavage sites. That it's a very important factor. It can enhance the viral tropism, so enable viruses to infect other hosts more easily because it's such a you know central protease so it's so present in so many species so uh, there was like a hobby almost for virologists to make synthetic viruses and to add furin cleavage sites here for example this is a porcine epidemic diarrhea coronavirus so not really SARS related but also interesting that they put a furin cleavage site into that one then here um, Xi Xing Li and Ralph Barrick actually put a furin cleavage site into HKU4, which is a MERS-like virus, but much less dangerous compared to MERS. But with that furin cleavage site, they made it as dangerous as MERS, which already has it. And then, for example, in this one, there are different types of avian influenza. For example, you've all heard of H H1N1, for example. So the hemagglutinin in this case uh, has been modified to also get a furin cleavage site. And some of these, for example, H5 and H7 cause very severe disease and H6 does not. So what they did here, Ron Fouchier in, in the Netherlands, again, in my opinion, very dangerous experiment. Uh, that they put the furin cleavage site, or in this case it's called it multi-basic cleavage site, into this H6 virus, and then they got very, very severe disease. For example, not only like the lung was infected, but also the brain and the heart and so on. And without the furin cleavage site, nothing really happened here. We also know from some experiments that if you remove the furin cleavage site from SARS-CoV-2, then, for example, hamsters don't get sick at all. They don't lose any weight. They have no disease score. So it's pretty sure that without the furin cleavage site, SARS-CoV-2 would have been a completely harmless virus. You would never heard about it. I think it's very important to, at this point, also consider that many of these viruses in which these furin cleavage sites were introduced are actually much, much, much more lethal, have a much higher case fatality rate than SARS-CoV-2. For example, HKU, I guess would be then similar to MERS, 35% roughly uh, fatality rate. SARS has already a 20% fatality rate with a few cleavage site, I don't know. 
um, this PED virus is especially dangerous to piglets. I don't know how dangerous it would be to humans with a urine cleavage site. Would maybe kill like a lot of newborns. And then H6N1 uh, is then as toxic as H5N1, which is uh, as lethal, 60% fatality rate, right? SARS-CoV-2, 1% fatality rate. So of all these experiments, SARS-CoV-2 is, is the by far least lethal one. The fume cleavage site here is also very unusual because it has some very unusual codons. You always have these three nucleotides that uh, code for one amino acid. And you can have different combinations of three nucleotides that code for the same amino acid. Then several species often have different preferences for different codons. And the CGG codon is very rare in uh, bad coronaviruses such as SARS. Uh, these others are much, much more common. However, it's fairly common in human. It's not the absolute most common one, but the most common one starting with the C. So it's kind of weird to see this in a bad coronavirus because it's not only there just once, but, but twice in this human cleavage site, in that insert. And then I think this is a very important thing. It's a human identical human cleavage site. Yeah? So there's hundreds of possibilities. Yeah, if you have these two R's, um, how to put other amino acids here to make it a fume cleavage site. And many of them would actually be more effective, like R, R, K, R, almost certainly more effective than R, R, A, R in this case. This is not what we see. We see a not super effective uh, one copied, you know, basically identical from the human protein, NAC alpha. Basically, NAC alpha has also this sequence, R, R, A, R, S, V, A, S. Of course, the last amino acids were already there, but it's still unusual to see a human identical one showing up here. So the question would be, of course, was it just copied from the human genome? And that is clearly not the case because you know, these insertions in nature happen in coronaviruses. Yeah, there's no question. And they can happen, for example, when an infected cell is infected with two different viruses, for example, or uh, it contains another RNA that has a very similar sequence. So for example, then in this case, the, the polymerase that produces the new genome of the next virus can fall off the template at some point and then attach via the already transcribed sequence to another template and then just keep reading here. And if it's very similar, it's not so unlikely that this will result in also a functional virus. But in this case, you usually have very similar flanking regions. So because if, if it's just a human mRNA, it needs to switch back to basically the viral one to uh, make a functional virus. And then you always have the same mRNA sequence. You would expect that the same human, in this case, GG, GCC, CGU, and so on, would also be found in SARS-CoV-2. And this is not the case. There's a lot of differences here. Uh, which basically tell us that this is not directly copied from a human mRNA. Yeah, you may have noticed the title here. It's a another paper by Bob Gary, and he's. Uh, we can quickly have a look. It's really beyond me how he argues here. Um, so basically, he says, and this is what what I don't understand really. Um, they already, you, there's an insert of four amino acids and not eight. But we know that five are already there, right? So why would you add another eight to get to eight? It just doesn't make any sense. You needed three of these four that were added and the other one had most likely another function. Then the next point he's raising is that it's an outer frame insertion and basically uh, it's a bit complex, but we don't really know that because there could have been a point mutation as well. We don't really know the exact natural related virus. And um, if one, one mutation would have been enough to make this in frame. And, and, and B, so what? Bioengineers can obviously just introduce something out of frame. If that gives you an insert that is functional and that does not need as many changes, I think in a virus you would do that because... The RNA sequence doesn't matter that much, but if you change it too much, 
it can change the secondary structure of the RNA, so basically the folding. And uh, if you introduce too many changes, then sometimes the RNA just doesn't function anymore. So you would always just introduce as few changes as possible. The proline, okay, this is not from NAC alpha, it's correct, but it's found in MERS, for example. So that could have been an inspiration. And then actually he says, you know, the codons are different in humans. And that's the reason why it's not, it doesn't make any sense. We just discussed this. This is basically showing that it's not copied from nature. And this is the same Bob Gary who said he can't think of any natural way how these four amino acids slash 12 nucleotides are introduced. As a summary, we can say that it is a human identical one, which is very unusual, maybe, you know, one in a hundred, one in 50 uh, furin cleavage sites would be human identical. And then if we look into the diffuse proposal again, we see exactly this mentioned. They, they were looking for furin cleavage sites and where those are not found, basically, they will introduce appropriate human specific ones. So basically the idea was to introduce as few changes as possible to find a virus that could directly come from the bat into humans and maybe copy some sequence from humans and that would be enough to start a pandemic and to demonstrate how few changes you only need to make this pandemic. So again, exactly what is written, what is described in the diffuse proposal. And if you don't want to stop here, yeah, this may be a bit speculative, but this uh, NAC alpha fume cleavage site was actually just described in 2018 at the University of North Carolina, where Irv Barak is working as well. So it's it's very likely he was he was aware of that publication and yeah, might have thought, oh, let's just you know we have SVAS here already. Let's just use that one because it's also an SVAS uh, fume cleavage site. Richard Ebright actually pointed this out very early on. The molecular origin evidence. Officially, there was never an ancestral virus. So the well-known, most related ones are now 2052 from Laos, uh, and then the Reggie 13 genome. Um, but what is not really discussed that much is that in, in 2018, there was at least a part of a virus uploaded uh, by two people we know actually, Eddie Holmes and Xi Sheng Li, they uploaded a RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So that part is responsible for copying the viral genome. They submitted this data in 2018, so pre corona. I don't see any reason here why they should have manipulated anything here. And uh, the rest of this genome, Reggie 13, was only published then in 2020 after the outbreak by the One Institute of Virology. So should be a bit skeptical. But if you look at the, the part that was published here, it's basically identical to, to SARS-CoV-2. I think it's 99.5% identical. There are like four changes in 920 amino acids, which is basically nothing. Okay, on RNA level, it's not... That related but RNA uh, sequences can be modified. In my opinion, this could have been part of a template virus. Uh, we, we have to be aware that uh, the RNA dependent RNA polymerase is more stable. It doesn't mutate as often as the spike. But you know, if you compare, for example, an Omicron spike with the Wuhan spike, then you see uh, there's a lesion here. There's so many mutation here, so that this is really nothing compared to that. So it, in my opinion, could have been that part could have been a template. Again, we only learned about the rest of the sequence after the outbreak. So this is the segment, basically a tenth of the genome that was published back then. It should have been mentioned in all the Eddie Holmes articles and he never, he just said in one video, he forgot about it, but he keeps not mentioning it even in the in his more recent publications. It's not easy to make up an entire viral genome sequence, of course, can't, can't do that, but this is a sequence, a, a virus that has never been found to be functional, and it's somewhat possible to manipulate the RNA sequence if you only introduce 
silent mutations because we are very good at seeing if you know some proteins cannot fold properly because we can now predict that with very very nice tools but if you change the rna sequence and then as in this case you say oh the, all the viral sample was used up and we don't have anything of that anymore then nobody can really verify if, uh, if something was changed here so let's have a quick close look at red 13 there was a very unusual finding when it was first uh, published. Basically, they found a lot of unexpected reads. So they said this was from a, I think, guano sample, and it should have had a lot of bacterial reads, which were not found. Then they initially said it was sequenced in 2020 after the outbreak. Later, they admitted it was actually sequenced in 2018, so before the outbreak. And then basically they kind of admitted it's it's the same sample as RA4991, which was part of a virus published um, in 2013 already. And I just recommend reading through The Out of China by Yuri Dagan. He lists all these really, really weird occasions around Red 13 and how we step by step by step learn that this is actually a virus that could have um, been in a in a mine in Mojiang that you may have heard about, uh, where uh, six miners actually uh, contracted a viral pneumonia and then three of them died later. So obviously this would have been a very interesting virus to study because it was already known that it's dangerous to humans. It apparently can't even bind to to bad ACE2. It's kind of, kind of weird to have a bad virus that is not binding to the respective bad receptor. Then apparently, according to this preprint, the genome can't really be assembled from what they've given us as like raw reads. There are some parts missing or something, uh, also very unusual. And then it has a very unusual mutation profile. So usually you see uh, fairly, fairly similar mutation rates for different changes. So C to T in this case occurred very unusually often. And you can also see here that there are a lot of silent mutations. So say the mutations that don't affect the protein sequence and very, very few non-silent mutations. So mutations that uh, do affect the protein sequence. These are mutations we could introduce without making it obvious. That was pretty much impossible. We also have this post by probably an anonymous virologist. Basically what you see here uh, when you compare SARS-CoV-2 with RED 13 is that you have all these um, synonymous mutations in that part of the genome, basically no non-synonymous mutations here at all. So basically here, you know, this is probably a foreign segment that was coming from recombination. That's why you see these two steep lines. Uh, you have some synonymous, non-synonymous ones here. But to just have one type of mutation, if you compare the two, actually you see these two parts that are that are really different. One is uh, the receptor binding motive. So within the receptor binding domain, that part that binds to human ACE2, and the other one is the human cleavage side. The rest of the genome is, is surprisingly similar. It's just these two parts. And then if you look again at the diffuse proposal, they specifically mention that they wanted to modify the receptor binding domain, which contains the receptor binding motif. And they wanted to introduce small deletions here. They wanted to generate the so-called micro variations. And of course, they wanted to introduce the uh, furin cleavage sites or other uh, cleavage sites. So again, exactly these two parts that differ here are the ones that I mentioned in the diffuse proposal. My conclusion is that at least 10% of a virus published 2018 from Wuhan was 99.5% identical on protein level. This should have been mentioned as a conflict of interest. Then we know that the Wuhan Institute of Virology and EcoHealth Alliance withheld about 180 SARS-related coronavirus genomes at least. This is an email from uh, Peter Daszak, where he, he says that it, it's extremely important that we don't have these sequences as part of the PREDICT release to gene banks so to be uploaded. Another very important point is that the diffuse proposal mentions that they wanted to work on consensus candidate genomes. 
So they may have had, you know, three, four genomes that were interesting and then planned to make a consensus genome out of them. So basically always using the amino acids that are most frequent in the three or four different genomes. And that could easily explain the differences between RADG13 and what we see in SARS-CoV-2. We have some evidence that the history of RADG13 is not communicated transparently and that the sequence may have been manipulated. They basically had to, at this point, publish RADG13 because the other part was already publicly available. So basically they had to tell, look, the rest of the virus is very divergent. It's very different because if you just look at that one part, it's it's like almost 99% identical. So that would have been too dangerous. Intermediate hosts, if you think about it from a functional perspective, an intermediate host is, is something that can propagate your virus efficiently, something that is more similar to humans yeah, and in, in, in closer contact with humans and it should, you know, have a highly related cousin strain, or if you go back in time, it should have an ancestral strain, so something older than what is found in humans. And actually, we found one quite a while ago, but nobody really talked about it. That is the Savai et al. paper, uh, Solimosi and Savai. They found a uh, unique SARS-CoV-2 variant as contamination in other sequencing samples. What you do here basically is you send your sample to a sequencing facility and those basically need these fairly expensive chips and that can then produce several million short DNA reads of usually below 300 base pairs depending on the machine, sometimes much shorter. And because it, it can produce so much data and so expensive, you basically combine several experiments into one chip and you know later you just ask from all your sequences which ones match to for example i don't know your human sequence and then you just uh, look at these sequences and from that you you basically read the dna sequence that you have here and if you have some contaminating uh, reads you just just ignore them they don't align to your target right so if someone else was running a, a viral genome project on the same machine he probably would have also gotten some human reads which you would just ignore. Obviously, we, you are not getting these viral genome results uh, from China, but we did get one um, where the focus was on uh, actually an, an Arctica soil sample. So it has nothing to do with Corona, but it was sequenced at a company called Sangon Biotech. And then these two scientists were really smart and just, you know, screened uh, thousands of uh, uploaded uh, genomes to find if they see any SARS-CoV-2 reads coming up before all the sequencing started in, in December. And actually they found these genomes. And according to this analysis by Jesse Plum, it's one of the two potential answers to, to all the lynches that we've seen in humans. This is also mentioned here in, in this uh, very interesting Twitter uh, report by, by Jesse Bloom, where he also mentions that these sequences were deleted again by, by NIH, but they were able to recover them. What we do know is that in that sample, they were like Vero uh, CHO reads and then human reads, likely from a human cell line. And if we look at the diffuse proposal again, then they exactly mentioned that they want to use Vero and then these are human cells to basically generate their synthetic viruses. This is called viral rescue. The Vero cell line is the most common, uh, commonly used cell line to generate these synthetic viruses. Everybody uses them. And they wanted to test uh, human ACE2 binding, which in some papers it's described that CHO is used here. And they mentioned that they wanted to do their DNA sequencing at exactly this Sangon Biotech company. So what happened here? I think the most likely explanation is that as Xi Xing Li mentioned this at one point that she was really worried that it was one of her experiments and that she looked through everything. And I think it could be something like that with you know, they send all their related viral samples from different experiments with related genomes 
for sequencing to find out if they had something like that. And that explains why we have both Cho and Vero and uh, these human cell lines in one sample. And uh, also the only known ancestral genome that preprint actually that described these sequences was also rejected as not relevant enough. I mean, imagine that the sequence that is ancestral to everything we've seen in humans and it's just described as not relevant enough. And we have some people here that, uh, you know, do this screening uh, for bioarchive where they wanted to upload that preprint. Very important questions here. Who rejected these preprints? Who deleted the data at NIH? And then what else, if not a lab leak, do Vero sequences indicate? We know that uh, these um, green monkeys from Ethiopia, from which these uh, cell lines are, are not susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. And they're in Africa, by the way. If you can trust virologists spreading such opinions, I don't know. This is also a very, very interesting find. I first noticed this uh, tweet by Martina Sisters on Twitter, but it was actually Inigo Jimeno that uh, programmed an AI tool to find SARS-CoV-2-like sequences. And what he found was really, really, really surprising. Basically, he found a 100% amino acid identical spike protein. You can see this alignment here, but without the fusion cleavage site uploaded from Beijing from a patient sample. And this patient had a pseudomonas infection in 2019. Initially, I thought, well, this is probably, you know, a later contamination. You have a sample from the patient. And before you send that to sequencing, it, some somebody was working on synthetic uh, spikes here. They wanted to see what it does without the fume cleavage site. And, um, and just, you know, this plasmid got into the patient sample and then was sequenced along. But we have four samples and they are from different, uh, different sources, basically. The, the human is from Henan province in China, so just, just north of Wuhan. And there are from sputum and blood and urine, I think. And this patient obviously had a pseudomonas um, aeruginosa infection. So this is a bacterium that can infect uh, open wounds in the skin. It can infect uh, lungs, apparently. I think there was a lung lavage sample here as well. So this person clearly had some lung issues. There were other virologists that immediately declared this to be a contamination, you know, that happened in 2020. So I asked, what's your evidence? Uh, why do you know that this is a con uh, later contamination and not from the original 2019 samples? Didn't get any response again. Then somehow the Chinese scientists involved here got informed and told the NIH to remove these samples and they were removed. I think you can still click on a link and access them. Why do that? I emailed the NIH and told them, please don't delete this data. Of course, never got a response. I tried to like communicate this with other people on Twitter to really understand what, what happened here. If A... We had a lab plasmid that contaminated four different thought medical samples in 2020, which would just indicate really, you know, bad lab routines, really unclean handling. Or if there was just one contamination into a patient somehow in, in 2019. Let's have a quick look at what this really is. If you if you look at the fuel cleavage site, you can see that there is not a complete deletion of the insert that we know from comparing this to RG13. There is one alanine that's still there, but the rest is just 100% identical to SARS-CoV-2. There's some parts upstream and some parts downstream. It's a kind of unusual deletion of a few cleavage site. It's not what we see in related viruses. The upstream part is a so-called signal peptide. This peptide is like the postal zip code that directs proteins within a cell to go to a specific compartment. Actually, this is a human one. It's called tissue type plus mention activator, TPA. And then we have a somewhat flexible linker sequence. So usually you have these G4S linkers in antibodies. And in this case, it's a G3S sequence, but it pretty much has the same function. So they link this 
and I didn't really understand at all what this lower part was, this whatever IKEA sequence. Uh, but there was this very well-informed post on, on Adino News, which I've never heard of before, that basically described this as trimers that basically can form a transmembrane domain. So they can basically enable whatever is attached to form a trimer. And the SARS-2 spike is a trimer. So basically, this is a like a membrane anchor or some other kind of anchor that ensures that the spike is always forming a trimer. If you look at the RNA sequence, there's tons of mutations, more than a thousand mutations in these 3000 nucleotides. So clearly a synthetic construct and it's actually codons that are very helpful for expression in, in humans or like human cell lines. However, if you have a closer look at the structure of these plasmids, so um, basically, it's the, the spike was put into a, a circular DNA plasmid that enables people in the lab to um, amplify the DNA fragment in, for example, bacteria. The whole plasmid structure was also extremely unusual. So, for example, yeah, sometimes you put in these green fluorescing proteins. They were not there in all the samples, just in some, and then some had like no stop codon, so they're not functional. There was no ampicillin resistance gene. So if you grow these uh, plasmids, it's the most commonly used plasmid, PCDNA 3.1. Um, if you grow them in bacteria, you add a, plas a resistance gene so that the bacteria don't eject the plasma from the cell and just grow like crazy and you don't get any DNA out of, out of your expression. So uh, actually these plasmids can't even be grown in the in the lab really, at least not with the typical antibiotic that they are designed for here. So it's it's really it's really weird. They are heavily mutated and such mutations also do not really occur in lab bacteria because the mutation causing genes are uh, removed there. However, they could still provide some uh, some functions as a resistance gene to uh, gentamicin which is, is, is used in China to treat Pseudomonas. Um, so it could be that after they got into Pseudomonas and this patient was treated with this antibiotic, the treatment didn't work. That's why the patient got so sick. And that's also why these plasmids were kept inside these Pseudomonas bacteria for so long. And in these Pseudomonas bacteria, they could obviously also mutate very easily as long as you know this core function remained functional. They could also be still capable of uh, producing spikes, although the receptors are a bit unusual, but they should they should still work. So summary, basically we have a 100% SARS-CoV-2 identical sample, just without a few inclusive side. It's clearly synthetic, no question. Uh, it's code optimized. It's in a very typical PCDNA vector with a human signal um, plasmid. Um, it could be a very unusual vaccine format that was used here. Um, and it is heavily mutated. Whenever you have one mutation in a, in a plasmid, then you throw it out and try to go back to your older samples that stay stable in the freezer for decades. Yeah, you don't get these mutations. And of course, not four different mutations. Nobody keeps this dysfunctional plasmids in the lab anyway. However, we do know, for example, that uh, in Beijing, some virologists used the identical plasmid and the identical TPA signal peptide and also human codon optimization to characterize spike proteins, in this case, SARS-1 spikes. So it's extremely similar to a construct that was used to characterize spike proteins and to identify uh, if that spike, for example, binds to a human receptor. And then if you look at the diffuse proposal, uh, they also mentioned that they want to work with codon-optimized, stabilized SARS-CoV-2 glycoprotein ectodomain, so basically the outside domain of the, uh, the spike. And they wanted to uh, introduce them into powders and dextran beads um, to make some kind of batch vaccine this would, I think, really well explain this C-terminal domain that we've seen, basically the domain at the very end that forms this stable trimer. Again, a very, very unusual construct. 
and it's technically extremely unlikely that these plasmids were kept in labs. It's much, much more likely, although this indicates that they had very, very sloppy, very unclean working conditions. Basically, you had to have either pseudomonas on your bench or maybe like in a wound in the skin or somehow got some of these plasmids onto your hands and then you touch your mouth to get them into your lung. But of course, these pseudomonas, they can mutate these plasmids very efficiently and you produce huge numbers of such plasmids to make, for example, a protein vaccine. You need tons of them. In my opinion, the most likely thing that happened here is that they worked very uncleanly with these plasmids in 2019, somehow contaminated a lab worker, a patient, someone like that. And then the gentamicin treatment didn't work and the person got very sick and these samples were taken. And now we know through this uh, AI tool that they were working with the SARS-CoV-2 spike already in 2019. There is one comment by Christian Anderson who basically later then deleted his uh, Twitter account or he said his tweets auto delete, which which I think there's not even a function. And he's commenting on, on the Reggie 13 and all the work they did, all the receptor characterization, which is basically something for which you would use plasmids like this. And he's really, really surprised that they were able to sequence SARS-CoV-2 and then also to find a related virus, which they back then said they hadn't even sequenced yet, and then sequence that as well, and then generate all these diagnostic tests and then basically show for both viruses which receptors they bound to and all that in a week, which is technically absolutely impossible. You know, that fact alone proves that they were working with Red 13 for much longer and didn't just sequence it back then and probably had all these bike characterization tests, uh, receptor binding tests going long before they, they officially got the first SARS-2 genome. It's impossible to do this in one week. Introduction to synthetic viruses. If I talk of synthetic viruses here, I uh, basically mean viruses that are generated by humans and viruses that always are based on natural templates. Nobody is just making up a virus. People always take a natural template and then they introduce very small alterations. For example, enhance the pathogenicity like the FCS introduction experiments. And also I want to say that like probably 99% of all viruses never do such dangerous experiments. Most viruses do very important clinical work or develop therapeutics, but some of them prefer to do this very dangerous experiments, which actually, this may sound weird, but also are fairly easy to do and fairly cheap to do and give you very high impact papers, which obviously provides an incentive. The whole technology was introduced by Ralph Barrick around 2000, at least for these large, roughly 30,000 base pairs RNA viruses. As you cannot handle these huge DNA fragments, so even RNA viruses are always first assembled as DNA because you just cannot uh, uh, manipulate RNA efficiently. And you can also not really handle 30 KB of DNA, at least not produce or modify it that efficiently. So he was always going to chop that genome into smaller sections. These smaller fragments are usually below 8,000 base pairs long. Usually you don't want to have too many of the segments. And then the most important question is what I always refer to as the, the blind puzzle challenge. Uh, you have to think of like five to eight pieces of DNA and you have to get them into the exactly right order and you have millions of copies of each uh, piece of DNA. The only way to do that is basically by using different linkers, right? Like having puzzle pieces. So this is a linear puzzle. It's just all white and you always have the same um, connecting piece on the puzzle it's just impossible to get blindly the, the correct sequence here. However, if there's a different uh, connecting side at each puzzle piece, this is obviously possible. And what they do there is they use so-called single-strand DNA overhangs or sticky ends. And if these sticky ends 
you have a complementary sequence, those will kind of, you know, stick together like a magnet. And if the, the sequence is not matching or mostly not matching, they will reject each other. And that way you can basically get a glued together genome. And then you add something called a ligase, which will close the little gap in the backbone and make this into one DNA. And what they always did here is use very special endonucleases, so DNA cutting enzymes or restriction enzymes, because they needed to have a unique sticky end for each fragment. So here, for example, TCT, which binds to AGA. For a long time, they used this enzyme called BGL1, and this has a recognition sequence of three nucleotides here and here, and then it cuts all the, any nucleotide in between. So you can basically, uh, if you put a C, uh, GCC, then five variable nucleotides, and then GGC, you will have this recognition site, and whatever the variable nucleotides are, will produce a sticky end. The vast majority of about 3,000 uh, restriction enzymes out there will not cut like that. They will always give you the same sticky end, so they just can't really be used for efficiently making viruses like that. You can use a different uh, restriction site theoretically for each fragment of the virus, but some of them, you know, tend to cut outside of their uh, recognition sequence, so they're not really that efficient, they're not really high fidelity, and some need different buffers, different temperatures, so it really becomes a nightmare if you don't apply this strategy, which is now absolutely used everywhere. So to introduce these restriction sites, you have to use synonymous mutations because you don't want to change the amino acid sequence of your virus. One harmful amino acid can, in theory, render a virus completely dysfunctional. Technically, and this was also in our preprint that I published in October together with Tony Van Dong and Alex Washburn, what you do is you amplify each fragment of your virus in a separate plasmid first to get high amounts of DNA. Then you cut them out, always with this unique sticky end. And then you put them all into one big DNA backbone, which is called bacterial artificial chromosome. In most cases, different technologies now, but this doesn't really make a difference. And then you get that bacterial artificial chromosome into a cell line Again, Vero. So basically you shoot little holes into your cell line and then you have your DNA in a vesicle and then the vesicle merges with the cell line and the DNA is transcribed in the cell line into RNA and the viral RNA genome is then translated into viral proteins and copied, copies itself into more RNA genomes and then basically that cell line will produce a so-called synthetic infectious clones for you that then can infect other cells. The big issue here is that the technology has advanced so rapidly that people make these viruses in a week. And the DNA and the material costs somewhere between five and 10,000 euros. So it's extremely, extremely dangerous technology. I'd like to have a very short side note. This is more for the experts a little bit. This is often mentioned as well that you can basically use also no CM cloning here. The traditional method is also with type 2S enzymes to have a recognition sequence and then it cuts next to that and they forgot the arrows here and I think those are a bit out of place but like in the end basically this recognition sequence will be cut off and uh, you will just have one at the the ligated site afterwards. However, you can also place these restriction enzymes basically always on the outside, so not on the viral segment side of your plasmid, but on the outside of the plasmid, so that you only cut out your viral segment. That allows you to basically place these sites almost everywhere. You just need three unique nucleotides, which is or four in this case with these enzymes. They are much better than the one they used before. And that basically gives you a lot of flexibility. The advantages here are easy assembly. The disadvantages you don't have any restriction sites in your final product. Yeah? So if you want to later put in a new spike, something like that, or modify it, then you don't have any sites to do that. So if you just want to build one virus, you would probably go for no seam cloning. If you want to screen like different variants, you would not. Another quick side note, why 8KB fragments is also asked a lot. 
so in the diffuse proposal they mentioned they want to use commercial gene blocks and that's a very common cutoff if you use larger fragments it gets very expensive um, but there are also some technical softer factors basically very large plasmids don't produce that well you have more often an error in there so you need to reorder the entire plasmid again and some some plasmids just don't grow if there's like too much dna because they have some negative effects on the bacteria they're grown in and we do know that a lot of synthetic viruses are assembled in china uh, for example this paper here found again as a contamination basically that the other the other only really highly related virus to SARS-CoV-2 that was published from, from Wuhan just before the outbreak, ZC45. For that virus, they basically found a fragment containing part of the virus and part of the expression plasmid. The endonuclease fingerprint. What we did in this paper is that we looked at which enzymes had been used at the Wuhan Institute of Virology and there were just very few. For example, BSA1, BSMB1 was used in, in a paper just in 2017. And then, as I said, BGL1 was used quite often. Then we checked, can we see in the synthetic variants of these natural viruses, basically still the, the genome stitching sites or the recognition sites for these enzymes after they are assembled obviously they published their protocols and what other design criteria they were mostly using so we found that it's mostly five to eight fragments the largest fragments usually be below 8 kb all the stick ends must be unique as you can see here if those recognition sites are mutated then you will find these in a, like a fairly regular pattern in your resulting genome so this is a paper from Wuhan that basically describes this process fairly well. They started off with a genome that basically had, I think, these uh, three BGL1 sites. And that is obviously something you can't synthesize at all in the lab, right? This is from 12 to 27,000, 50,000 base pairs, completely impossible. So they initially designed seven fragments here. They later had to split that smallest fragment actually into two because it was toxic in bacteria. So sometimes there can be small fragments. It's not something you, you aim for, but no, it can happen. And all of these novel sites indicated by black triangles here were introduced with synonymous mutations, these stars. And there was one synonymous mutation for another function. And then this one was removed with the synonymous mutation. Yeah? So the difference between the synthetic variant and the natural template here is only in synonymous mutations, and all the synonymous mutations are in these stitching enzyme recognition sites. We, of course, we don't really know exactly the template, uh, but we thought maybe we find this pattern, maybe we find these uh, stitching sites. So this is uh, the map of, of two synthetic viruses. This is the natural template. You see very few, huge spaces in between the um, restriction sites. And then in the synthetic variant, they are fairly spaced over the entire genome. This is the case for this with one virus, um, the natural one, again, this 15 KB fragment, and then the synthetic one, fairly evenly spaced. Yeah, this tiny fragment, okay. And basically we said that, okay, these synthetic viruses seem to have uh, all these similar parameters, right? So below 8 kb in length and between 5 and 8 kb fragments. So this is kind of the, the Goldilocks zone for synthetic viruses. While, you know, just random enzymes uh, here in gray, they usually are very different. Usually you have much larger fragments if you just have five. Um, and then there's obviously, if your natural template is already here, yeah, if you only have to introduce one change, very difficult to tell. But if the natural template is very different, you see these huge differences, long arrows, um, and then you can conclude something from this stitching site pattern analysis. When we compare this to other synthetic viruses, so all these 
colorful dots here are other synthetic viruses, then you can see that SARS-CoV-2 is, is right in the center of this, this ideal window of synthetic assembly. That alone is not telling you that much yet. Yeah. You need to look at the related viruses. That's about 1% chance to, to have a, a natural virus within that window. It's not completely impossible. You can see that here. And there was a recent publication which basically said what we said is uh, not correct, but they had to screen 1300 viral sequences and they found 14 genomes for which they match. So yeah, very close to that 1%. There's another important consideration. If you want to go in and later modify your synthetically assembled virus, if you use just one restriction in the nuclease to cut it open again, basically once you assemble it, then basically you destroy your entire backbone. You know? However, if you use two different ones, so red and purple here, and you just use the purple enzyme, you only cut out a region of interest. So if you want to test, for example, furin cleavage site or receptor binding domains, then it would be very helpful to have uh, two um, stitching sites from the same enzyme flanking this region. This is what we call the region of interest manipulation in the paper. Uh, we actually use exactly the same tech uh, for our therapeutics, right, which are completely harmless and uh, hopefully very, very beneficial for patients. So if you want to change the antigen peptide, if you want to have, if you have a plasmid that induces tolerance to, let's say, insulin, then we want to have one that induces tolerance to myelin. We don't want to destroy the entire fragment, so we just, you know, digest that backbone with the BSMB1 and ESP3I actually rec has exactly the same recognition sequence, so they are functionally exactly the same enzymes. Basically, we use this pair to cut out a 300 base pair segment around the peptide and put in a new one, and it's very, very reliable and efficient. Uh, if you want to change the production tag that we use for purification or you know for some testing, we use this PEG C1 type 2S restriction enzyme. If you want to you know, change the presenting domains, we use BSA1. And this is the paper in which they used basically in, in 2017 exactly BSA1 and BSMB1. This is a supplementary figure to put in modified spikes. But they used a slightly different process here. They, they used no seam cloning, so they were able to place basically the restriction sites directly flanking the spike which is not possible if you use, if you keep the restriction site inside the spike, you have to find very few bases where you can do that without changing the amino acids. Looking at the plan and the fuse proposal, they wanted to uh, introduce these highly variable uh, receptor binding domains, these micro manipulations, and these, as I said, uh, modified Fueling cleavage sites and then test them in combination. So this is clearly a region of interest, the fueling cleavage site and the receptor binding domain. And in the SARS-CoV-2 genome, we have exactly that region flanked by BSA1. We have three other BSMB1 sites um, that are needed for assembly, and then BSA1 flanks the segment that is uh, then can be replaced theoretically. We don't find anything alike in any other natural virus. If you have understood these two parameters and you can find a, any bad coronavirus that has them, please let me know. Uh, then we've showed basically how many changes are needed to get from a highly related virus such as the 52 banal virus or the Regi 13 virus to there and it's actually quite a lot. You need to um, yeah, remove and add quite a number of restriction sites, uh, at least five changes. Um, so basically, it's not, not a situation where you just need one and you can't really tell anything. So SARS-CoV-2 is the only related virus, or the only virus actually I know, that has a pattern of these uh, previously we've used uh, endonucleases that is basically ideal for library screening, for manipulating RBD 
and fewer cleavage sites. And a lot of these uh, restriction sites are actually found in related viruses. So a lot of virologists said, you know, this is completely obvious that they are not introduced, they are coming from another virus. But as a bioengineer, you know, you would always use a site in another virus and they knew 180 genomes. Yeah? So you'd always go pick a site in another virus because you know that this site is not um, interfering with viral with, with production of the virus because it, it enables another virus to grow, right? So it's always safer to use a site that you already know is functional. So you basically can't conclude anything from that given the many sequences they had known. Um, and then also uh, we checked the, the BGL1 sites. It's just much less suitable for, for these high throughput assays that they were planning. Uh, but they're just, you know, one restriction site in in SARS-CoV-2, so they would have to add a lot of add to a lot of changes. So clearly not so favorable. And then virologists have before done exactly that. They have before used functional sites that were published before, or you know, aligned them with an existing synthetic reverse genetic system, so synthetic. And this also allows you to replace uh, certain segments later if you say if you see that i don't know maybe your uh, last part of the genome is not functional you could maybe take that one and and add that as the secondary structure of rna it's not just you know a <laughs> not doubled helix it really kind of like finds its uh, homologous pairs and then forms these structures so if you introduce too many changes you can interfere with these structures and change the accessibility of certain areas of the RNA and that can affect the virus. So you don't want to uh, change too much here. We did a few more analysis. So but in this experiment, we basically ignored that you have to have um, always unique sticky ends in the controls in gray. So basically this is just ran the random distribution and those are all the synthetic genomes. So SARS-CoV-2 is even better than some other published synthetic viruses. This is if you focus on BSA1, BSMB1, you see that the distribution of these sites compared to 1065 other viruses and fragments, five to seven, uh, five to seven fragments, then the it's the most ideal distribution. So ideal would be a 30 KB virus five fragments, each exactly 6,000 base pairs long. Okay, obviously completely impossible to do if you want to leave this, the restriction sites in, but just to let you know what an ideal distribution was and then the most, uh, the worst distribution was if all your sites at the very, very beginning and then there's just no sites anymore. Uh, we also asked the question, how likely is it that uh, random mutations have led from these known natural relatives, at least banana 52 is, in my opinion, uh, clearly a natural virus, to something like SARS-CoV-2. So we basically checked how many mutations are differing here. It's about 700. And then we uh, 10,000 times mutated these genomes with like 700 mutations, 800 mutations, and then checked how many of these resulting genomes would give you a pattern that is as good as SARS-CoV-2 and that's only the case in 0.1% of the cases for, for Banal 52 and about 1% for RADG13. Quite unlikely. Um, of course we checked for other parameters but these are not really unexpected so all the sticky ends are unique. Yeah, you kind of expect that anyway. Um, and then the, all the changes within these sites are synonymous, which is for 12 mutations a bit unusual, but it's not really that unusual. It's highly unusual though to have 12 mutations here. And this actually is the key finding of the paper. The You can always see that in, in basically papers that the most robust, the most trustworthy result is the one with the lowest p-value, the p-value tells you how likely it is that your result 
just a match randomly. So if the likelihood is 1%, you will have a, a p-value of uh, 0.01, um, and that is usually considered significant. Um, and um, basically here we have a p-value of 9 times 10 to the minus 8 of finding 12 synonymous mutations in these very small fragments spread out all over the genome. Yeah. So basically you would expect to find one or two. Um, and what we found is 12 for the SARS-CoV-2 Red 30 comparison. So what we know from that is that one of these sequences is highly likely mutated. So it's the chances less than one in a million this just occurred by chance you know there's no these these restriction sites don't play any role in the natural evolution of viruses so there's no explanation why they should specifically accum accumulate in these stitching sites and um, we know that you know viruses with and without these stitching sites exist so they also don't have a functional effect whatsoever um, Yes, I've discussed this with a lot of virologists. Most of them just then turn silent once they couldn't really explain what's happening here. Um, and in my opinion, this still is one of the strongest and clearest pieces of evidence. As I said, that alone below one in a million chance. And if you can explain that, let me know. But Please don't come up with, you know, what, what many virologists said is like, you know, if we just look at SARS-CoV-2 um, and we check all, we include all the viruses that were published from China after, after the uh, um, SARS-CoV-2 outbreak, we can construct a um, recombination pattern that can explain why at least most of these sites are here in SARS-CoV-2. But this is not helpful here. Yeah. We can't tell that this is the, the non-mutated one and this is the mutated one or the other way around. We just know that one of them is mutated and there's basically zero chance to find then the same, um, the same recombination pattern uh, for, for RADG13. So they are just, just missing the point. Recombination replaces huge fragments of genomes, right? Usually a thousand base pairs, usually entire spike can be smaller, but they never introduce these very targeted synonymous mutations spread all over the genome in these very tiny segments. It's just a completely different mechanism. If you have a person that has a this shot in the head and then you have you find a guy with a hammer yeah, it's kind of suspicious to find a guy with a hammer, but it doesn't tell you anything about that murder case, right? Bitter conclusions. If we look at the evidence, both circumstantial and the molecular evidence, there's quite quite a long list. Um, let's just put it, put it here. And then we ask how much of that evidence actually correlates with what was described in the diffuse proposal. Basically, we can go through all of these pieces one by one. Uh, for example, poor biosafety leaks was clearly the case in Wuhan. Um, we knew from, from 2018 cables that there was a huge biosafety issue in Wuhan. Then experiment at BSL2 labs, of course, is by itself a huge biosafety risk. And then if you remember the map, the outbreak. If we put any weight on the on the market thing, uh, the market data it started right next to a BSL two lab. Then the the key response facility shutdown, Wuhan Institute of Virology mentioned in the diffuse proposal. Uh, we have uh, really suspicious emails and dishonest authors regarding conflicts of interest, such as Peter Daszak trying to push another narrative. He's 
the main applicant of the refuse proposal. We have a deleted database from the World Institute of Virology mentioned in the diffuse proposal, and we had no lab investigations whatsoever. There are eyewitness statements, again, from EcoHealth Alliance in the diffuse proposal, and we have the outbreak location and timing. I mean, this is an application from 2018, having a late 2019 outbreak is exactly in the timing you would you would kind of expect here, right? I mean, we could look at the 40, 50 year time frame. as far as it's never come up, then one year after this application, it's there. Um, location, again, out of thousands of cities, exactly the one with, with the lab. Sick, one is of virology researchers. And then if you look at the molecular part, basically the sampling sites, uh, we, have a, we have a coronavirus that binds to human ACE2 and human uh, DC sign that is mentioned here. We have a uh, related virus that was synthetically assembled, uh, such as ZC45. Uh, we have a likely somehow manipulated Red G13 sequence with, with changes in the RBD and the FCS mentioned here. We have a human specific furin cleavage site. At least the human specific proteolytic site is mentioned here. The end usual codons speak for non natural origin. We have a direct ancestor in the same sample as Vero cells sequence at Sangon. Both Vero and Sangon are mentioned here. We have a 2019 spike samples that basically contain plasmids that exactly match experiments suggested in the diffuse proposal, like this bad vaccine designs. And we have a restriction site pattern that is ideal for receptor binding domain and few include site modifications, which we have not seen in any other virus. Again, these are key elements of the diffuse proposal. And we have this highly, highly significant increase of mutation frequencies of synonymous mutations that don't really affect evolution. My conclusion is that cumulatively this proves a lab origin beyond reasonable without. I would put the number above 99.9%. It's a, a terrible conclusion. It basically means that what was planned as a harmless experiment resulted in possibly the worst industrial accident ever. But given how they were working there, what all these different leaked molecular pieces of evidence tell us, basically, I don't think we can come to any other conclusion. In my opinion, it's it's not that clear which lab it actually was. So basically, it could have been any diffuse lab. So they originally planned to do some of the cloning work in at UNC. It could have been a collaboration partner. You know, they maybe didn't get their uh, application through here, so they collaborated with someone else and uh, wrote another grant application. We know that Holmes and Shang uh, started a a partnership with the Wuhan Center of Disease Control, which is running one of the two biosafety level two labs. So Holmes had access to that uh, genome. Yeah, you never know. It could have been a transport leak, right? There's this really shocking tweet by, by, by Edward Hammond. He's basically citing Marion Koopmans, who used, who, who transported Zika uh, in, a, in her pocket, basically, from Brazil. Highly legal, highly risky. I think there's one quote of uh, Trosten also transporting some virus in a, in a car. Yeah, again, you know, things can just happen all the time. Maybe something had, some collaboration partner was bringing it to Wuhan to do further experiments with these viruses, and then he got robbed. He got into an accident, his luggage got somehow switched or lost at the airport. I don't know. So 
the question which level was exactly i don't know i'm not so sure about but that it was a lab i think it's case closed my experience here is that it doesn't matter that much what i do as, as a scientist it really really depends on, on what you are doing try to help support others write a letter to the european union we had like i think 18 scientists uh, we didn't even get a 15 minute phone call in the us at least they are now now starting to do investigations in europe they are still in complete sleeping mode i think there have been already an, another synthetic or another lab derived pandemic the evidence is pretty clear since since covid uh, we can talk about that another time we need people to get involved this is no longer a question of science. So I invite you to fact check everything I said here. I'll put all the links in the description. And yeah, ask for help if you get stuck. I'll like show on my next slide a lot of experts. It's always good to get a second opinion. And then I think it's very important that we act. We've seen that extremely, extremely dangerous viruses were experimented on. Start a petition in your country. I started one in Germany. It didn't really get very far yet. But that can change. You can inform others, discuss, network, become uh, politically active. There is now a nonprofit organization, biosafetynow.org, which I really trust. You can write a letter to your local representative or to journalists. There are some templates in German on, on stopgov.com, my blog. And then there is uh, an English one on biosafetynow.org. We have to act. We have to get to build something like the International Agency for Nuclear Surveillance for gain of function Research. We could make the labs much, much, much safer. We could just put them on an island in the middle of a desert. We could quarantine people working with these viruses for a week or two weeks, whatever it takes, and then test them every day they leave the lab. We could uh, introduce video surveillance in these labs and audio surveillance so that if an error occurs, that's documented, it's communicated, and other labs don't reproduce this. Keep in mind that something much worse could happen pretty much any day we don't keep this under control. And I'd like to thank a lot of a lot of people, first of all my family, who, who had to endure a lot. Basically, none of our uh, vacations were unaffected for the last uh, two years. They kind of noticed all the, the negative press. And then I want to thank, of course, my, my co-authors, Tony and Alex, you're amazing. I'd like to thank uh, Justin Kinney for some comments and review on the, on the preprint, Jörg Wischusen my supervisor at work or uh, co-inventor of the AIM technology, my entire AIM team for doing such excellent research as it's not a question of evidence here anymore. Time for me to move on, put this investigation part at least at rest. Maybe with our technology, it's even possible to prevent the formation of autoantibodies. So this could even be useful for long COVID. And then I'd like to thank all these amazing scientists keep publishing excellent articles on the origin of COVID. Quite a few of them actually are, I think, anonymous virologists. Please consider using uh, using Trastic Research for their whistleblower program. You can tell them whatever you know or without even disclosing who you are. If you dare to, please show your face to the world. Say that it must stop now. I know the consequences can be very severe. But the consequences of not doing so could be even much more severe. And with that, I like to come to an end um, and leave you with this last message that I believe that if we don't end enhancing pathogens, an enhanced pathogen may one day end us. Uh, I don't know exactly when the Antarctica samples were sequenced. I think they were sent there in end of 2019. And I don't really know exactly when the sequencing took place. How do biosafety and adaptic advocates avoid getting categorized as crazies? Querdenker. 
<laughs> I don't know. I have uh, been insulted uh, quite a lot here as a kindergarten biochemist. I think this is just, just you know, one example of how investigative journalism is, is failing here. And I'm also pretty sure that in the, this video will be countered by people saying, uh, you know, I don't have any idea what I'm talking about. And they will obviously find these articles. So let's, let's just have a very, very quick look. So this one is uh, just one example from Germany that, in my opinion, demonstrates that there's just often no basic, you know, scientific understanding of the matter that is discussed here. And uh, from the journalist side, there's often a complete reluctance to investigate. You're just basically always asking a virologist and whatever he says, you, you write down. So this is an example from um, German public media uh, outlet MDR. They are interviewing uh, Professor Dr. Alexander Kekule, he was he was commenting on the on the endonuclease finger uh, fingerprint preprint, and he you know the first two first sentences here are like these restriction enzyme recognition sites work like this. They are actually enzymes in the cell, enzymes such as so proteins that can cut DNA or RNA, so genetic information. At the very specific point, uh, these restriction enzyme BSA that work now says is in a very strange way only very rarely present in SARS-CoV-2. Everything he says here is, is just is just wrong. So first of all, these restriction enzymes come from bacteria. They're not there in any human cell. Then they also don't cut RNA. They are not felt like that. That's probably the journalist's fault. He was probably not willing to have a look at the preprint before at least writing the transcript of this audio podcast, he's completely missing the point of the paper. I mean, restriction enzymes are never present in viruses, right? The entire paper is about restriction sites or recognition sites. And then it's not at all about having few of these sites i mean i don't i don't really don't get it and then this is followed by a long list of insults basically he says we only have half knowledge we publish nonsense we fabricate it uh, it's complete nonsense and the journalist uh, concludes that this is just a study to to raise attention to us as authors i couldn't care less uh, you can totally believe me about getting uh, any uh, recognition for my COVID investigations. Not at all. I just want to be safe here. But, you know, how can you have such a limited understanding of the matter? And I checked it again. This is in Germany. This is high school biology. Yeah? We have to learn about restriction enzyme. This this journalist could have gone home, talked to his 17-year-old daughter, played that clip to her, and she could have told him that this is this is all nonsense. There is no restriction enzymes in the cell. They don't cut RNA. Uh, they are not in viruses. And this is clearly labeled as a bioengineering paper. It's so easy. Just, you know, go to the preprint open up the comment sections, you see what informed people are asking. You see our answers. You get a general feeling. If this would be all half knowledge and nonsense and so on, you would immediately see it there. This has been read by my industry partners, by my wife's colleagues. This is very impactful on, on, on the career of a you know young scientist. This is about 20 million deaths. Yeah. A probably very important piece of information and you're not even willing to to at least google how you spell the enzymes for five minutes to verify by looking up wikipedia if what you're propagating what you're putting into the world is at least remotely correct 
I don't know. I just don't just, just don't get it. I think it's uh, both a failure in the field of virology, but also massively in the field of investigative journalism. And um, this is exactly the same same combination we see in the raccoon dog story. I've written a short substack on that. Uh, if you want to go through, it's. Actually, I think it's a, it's a hoax, pretty much. Like, the reporting here was really based on absolutely nothing. Yeah. Um, I'll, I can put, uh, put another link in the, in the description. Um, I can put it in the chat as well, maybe. You know, just tell these newspapers that they should at least, you know, this entire paper is centered around um finding sample with the tiniest amount of SARS-CoV-2 particles. I'm not even sure if it's entire virus because it was PCR negative in 45 cycles, but only fragments were found in, in sequencing. We don't know how much exactly. This entire wave of raccoon dog reporting was based on um, basically rumors, right? We didn't have anything from, from the scientists who, who pushed that story, except for like conflicts of interest, which you could have checked immediately, but that wasn't done. And they basically, you know, nobody reported on the, on the original preprint that basically said, oh, we have checked again, 450 samples from from 188 animals which are all negative we have not found any ancestral or divergent SARS-2 lineage we have uh, sam found samples uh, to correlate significantly with human nucleate assets and then actually vendors selling veggies were more often tested positive for SARS-2 and then we have some rumors about raccoon dog RNA and that gives the news some names to back the story and people people go crazy it's like the moon hoax yeah um you just have like some interesting details some complex sounding technology and some names that you say okay that sounds plausible and you know cute pictures that seems to be the, the big thing nobody's looking at conflicts of interest uh christian anderson you know completely ignored um ignores that most of these authors are paid again and i mean the only thing we really learned from that uh, study was that raccoon dogs were at the wuhan market which we already kind of knew from uh this this paper at least in other markets and you know we, they get a cute picture and a a resonating story because people have heard about raccoon dogs before and that's it then this goes through every major news outlet and you know even if the headline is misleading i think that's still misleading the public 80 percent of people don't read beyond the headline a lot of people will have the impression that this is just case closed so if you want to go into the specific weaknesses in basically the key finding here is a lot of these reads in this in this one cherry picked sample out of hundreds uh, this was mostly raccoon dog context okay so contexts are like larger fragments i'll come back to that um, and then some duck and then no human right and this was a sample labeled as positive although it was pcr negative and if you go through the paper they write like the preponderance of early cases um, have been directly linked to the market we discussed that right thousands of cases were never sequenced and hundreds were never published and the earliest ones actually are uh, the most of them don't have a link to the union seafood market they write that most SARS-CoV-2 found where the animals were sold I think we discussed it as well this is the area where the toilets are and where the my young rooms are if you correct for how many samples were taken you see this correlation clearly with with that area and not so much with the booths where like live animals were sold they said that raccoon dogs are susceptible this is simply not known there is one study looking into raccoon dogs I wrote a quick email to verify this to the first author he responded immediately and this study was not done with the 
dense circulating variant of SARS-CoV-2, but with one that was much fitter, a D614G variant. We, we know, for example, that this variant was needed to enable SARS-CoV-2 to infect minks. Yeah. So they basically, we don't, we still don't know if the original virus was able to even infect uh, raccoon dogs. And what they found with the enhanced virus, with the better virus, is that the RNA copies were really low, 50,000 per mL from the nasal swaps. Yeah. You have in humans um, 100 million per mL, yeah. even more, even, I think, a few billion. Yeah. Um, so basically, if you find 10,000 times less uh, viral load in an animal, you basically this basically means that in theory you need ten thousand times more uh, DNA reads to just be on like you know same probability level. This was not not considered at all. Then you know you could have done the same story for cow, for example, yeah, which is clearly not an intermediate host, and which just was just sold as steak, um, and there was also no human DNA there in SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the there, there are much more problems. For example, um, there's like in this case almost no RNA, really low PCR negative, 45 cycles. Um, and then they uh, basically chose a length of context. So basically these are assembled short fragments of DNA uh, that was exactly at that length that you wouldn't find human anymore. So they basically zoomed out to a level that you don't see the human DNA anymore. They knew this basically, yeah. If they would zoom in to, to 100 base pair context, you would get them. And if you look at reads, which is really the important unit here because you just want to know how much human DNA is there, then uh, basically there's, there's quite a few reads in the sample. It's getting, getting even worse. For example, they write that they don't know the exact experimental procedure used to generate the data. Yeah. But the paper that generated the data used a kit to remove human nucleic acids. And now they write basically, oh, we don't find human nucleic acids, so this must come from a pangolin. Some of them have mentioned in, in, in Twitter that, uh, you know, it's not impossible to only remove human nucleic acids, not animal. But this is just not true. You know, human nucleic acids could come from saliva. Uh, so they can be really accessible and can be easily removed. While, for example, DNA from blood is known to be much, much harder to remove. In a lot of crime scenes, you see that, um, that uh, DNA is kind of, baked in with the fibrinogen that uh, basically forms these tiny little uh, kind of hard um, collagenated fragments in which the DNA is very stable for very long. So it's very likely that, you know, the saliva derived DNA was removed and the one from butchered meat was not. Anyway, even if you don't think that's the case, you still have to write that a kit was used to remove human DNA. This is just, it's just completely, completely unscientific. So basically, I think this is, this is a hoax. Uh, we already see some reports that say uh, this is just not robust. All of these reports were written when they didn't have anything, no preprint, no report, you know, just a few rumors. This is just not within the realms of science anymore. And it's, it's really easy. I mean, this is, I found these points. In, in like a night shift yeah took me a bit longer to write it down but um, if you correct for that and then even if you find 600 times more raccoon dog dna and you know that raccoon dogs have 10,000 times less covid titers then you know it's still 20 times more likely that the covid uh, rna you find sars cov2 rna is coming from humans i think this this is uh, very harmful for for the trust in science and I hope we can we can repair the trust at some point. What do you think explains the psychological reluctance of science to look at this? Well, I think a lot of people 
just don't see the overall threat. They, they still believe that this is a one-time event. So basically where we are at now is that we see an explosion of you know synthetic virology, more and more biosafety level three and four labs for even more dangerous viruses. We had uh, Professor Wiesendanger in, in Germany, who is not, uh, not a virologist, he's a nanophysicist, very renowned scientist. He basically published a cumulative study or uh, a accumulation of um, circumstantial evidence that showed that SARS-CoV-2 may have come from a lab, you know, suspicious uh, cell phone data, suspicious um, um, reactions of political members, at least in the German mainstream media, he was heavily attacked. He later got sued by, by Christian Trusten. Actually, I don't even know if I can say this, but let's just, you know, let's just quote from the newspaper for what he got sued over. Um, so what, what Citra writes here is that these, this organization, Scientists for Science, in a counterpoint to recent calls for restrictions on research that may render pathogens more dangerous, uh, 36 scientists, one of them Christian Trosten, from several countries have issued a formal statement asserting that research on potentially dangerous pathogens can be done safely and is necessary for a full understanding of infectious diseases. And Professor Wiesendanger later said that Scientists for Science had the aim to uh, keep biological research free from um, these limitations. And he got sued over that and he's not allowed to say that anymore. And he had to pay, I think, tens of thousands of euros in legal fees. And this was not the only point he got. He was, uh, he's now allowed to say that it was like a disinformation campaign. I think that is what keeps many scientists from um, from speaking out. So basically, you know, a lot of people here involved, for example, Jeremy Farrar is now at the WHO, the World Health Organization. Um, then Anthony Fauci uh, ran the NIH until recently. Those give out huge grants, not only for virologists, for all kinds of people. So you kind of risk getting funding, maybe, for your lab. I don't know. But uh, you risk your reputation. Um, you risk to be laughed at by other scientists. I think this is what kept others from, from speaking out here. Then, with regards to the, the ongoing risks, basically, why, why, why scientists may not speak out. Another reason is uh, I, Eddie Holmes, he was voted on uh, to be New South Wales Scientist of the Year. See, like these guys are not really, yeah, whatever. Um, and then Peter Daszak, Equal Health Alliance, according to this overview, got uh, 26 millions in funding since the COVID outbreak. So basically, and they have no consequences. There's no real consequences at all for them. Uh, 46 million total in government money, despite not publishing their um, reports, despite not being transparent, despite all these things. And the Wuhan Institute of Virology is actually assembling synthetic Nipah virus. It's a 70% mortality virus. Most people just have the feeling that what happened is that we have, you know, we've hit, been hit by a comet and that's it. And whatever, whatever happened, happened. And let's just cope with the situation. But I don't think that's the case. I think we've been hit by, by, you know, the tiniest part of a comet and the big one is still out there. And uh, people are just playing, playing don't look up. If a virus like this or one, for example, like that was generated in, in the Netherlands by Ron Fouchier, he, he basically adapted H5N1 and I think also H5N7, so 60% case fatality rate viruses to make them more adapted to human so that they can transmit 
via air, by aerosols from human to human. This is a completely synthetic risk. This actually triggered a huge outcry and activated a lot of scientists who warned us that something like this will, would happen again if we keep enhancing these synthetic viruses. And I think, uh, yeah, something much, much worse could could happen anytime again or already happened maybe. The public is not really that interested anymore. I, I can understand that people are getting tired here. This has been the same question, the same topic over and over again, but it's way too important to, to be ignored or to, you know, look the other way. When we try to get through to politicians. So basically I try to write this petition and so far 170 people signed it, which is nothing. And I'm maybe just not, not a very good activist. Um, so, uh, the link is the first link in the description. If you help, uh, push that, I would be very happy to, to get politicians interested in this, to get them active on EU level. As I said, I helped write a letter or an open letter to the EU commission together with people from the Paris group. And, uh, as it's, you know, obvious, they won't react to a single uh, researcher, but I hoped that they would at least, you know, talk to us half an hour when you're like 18 scientists and most of them already established professors, but uh, they didn't really react at all. They, they told us, oh, we'll put this uh, to the respective department and then we basically never hear back from them. Andre Goffini is actually very active in this field. He is writing emails all the time and it's just, it's just zero reaction, I think. The political failure is, is tremendous and I'm really hopeful that what's happening in the US is uh, kind of swapping over into Europe and that we start looking because there's so many things that you can you can find out even without having access to China, having access to uh, to the lab directly and to, based on these findings, become politically active. Because, you know, the alternative will just be the next synthetic pandemic, in my opinion. Any chance the preprints are getting published? Some are getting through now. I don't know exactly about the Nippa preprint. But even, even with that data here from the market, I think, although being so essential, I, I think it was in review for more than a year. So, you know, you just need one, one virologist if you publish a virology paper who says, no, I come up with questions over questions and change requests, change request, change request. And if the editor doesn't say, okay, now this is getting ridiculous after a while, you're not even allowed to make these comments public most of the time, then you're just stuck in the loop. Uh, I think this happened to Alina Chan with one paper for more than a year. It's just getting ridiculous. Oh, linking the slides. Yes, I can try to do that. I think there could be an issue because there's a lot of animations here, but I'll try to. Okay, thanks a lot for, for staying on so long. I hope this was this was informative to you. If you have any other questions, just uh, also comment below the YouTube video. Maybe I'll try to do a, a Q&A at some point. And um, with that, thanks so much for your attention.